Hey guys, welcome back. We're in episode 44 now. Today we're talking about dog body language. We're uh, calling this the tail of the tail. So, you know, like a tail, like a, you know, like a story. Like heads and tails? Story of the tail of a dog's tail. And uh, a little backdrop today. We're outside on the property. We got our guinea fowl flock relaxing in the sunlight. We're outside. It's a uh, dust bath action. It's colder than a tauntaun and a wampus <laughs> cave on Hoth, if you know what I'm saying. Anyone out true. there who got that reference? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> All right. So today we're talking about dog body language. This is something that I talk about with people when I'm doing follow-up sessions with them, return sessions with them, uh, training sessions with them, even people I'm just passing by or even consultations. There's a lot of misunderstanding about dog body language and the important thing to keep in mind is you know remember what we've talked about in previous podcasts that dogs are nonverbal beings meaning they communicate primarily through their body language right so me and you ben us uh we all we're primarily a verbal species mm-hmm. so we communicate primarily through verbal communication that's why podcasts are so valuable because yeah. we can, uh, you know, listen to the verbals. Don't have to see anything. Gain some knowledge. Don't have to see anything. If you do want to watch it, though, you can watch it on YouTube. Absolutely. Right? But otherwise, podcast is just verbal. So we are a primarily verbal species. Dogs are uh, nonverbal. Mm. So what that means is we have to have a good understanding of their native language so that we can communicate better with them. And if we can communicate better with them, that means that we're able to enhance our relationship with them, our understanding of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So today I've picked out the major points of dog body language that typically come up. Typically people are surprised by when we start talking about it. And as we go through these, kind of think of some scenarios that you might be in with your dog or if you're passing by some dogs, you can look at these things. Even if you don't have a dog, if you're listening to this and you don't have a dog, you just like listening to us uh, talk and you don't have a dog, uh, maybe you go over to a friend's house or a relative's house, mm-hmm. they might have a dog and you can pick up on this body language, yeah. gives you a better understanding of what the dog is feeling at the time yeah. and that's going to change based on factors in the environment, context that are going on around you, all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So, uh, yeah, you can definitely pay attention even if you don't have a dog Yeah. because obviously it's different for me and you now or most of us here, but I mean, before we were doing dog training, mm-hmm. a dog just, you know, everything about a dog, hey, he's a happy boy, you know, you yeah. see no issues. Well, the know? other thing too <laughs> is, uh, you know, maybe you're uncomfortable with dogs but you feel bad for not interacting with like your family member's dog Mm -hmm. because they bring their dog over or you Mm -hmm. go over to their house. You want to make that person feel comfortable, right? Maybe the dog's uneasy, but you don't know that you're just trying to make your friend or your family happy. We got to get out of that mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about making your friend happy. It's not about making your family member happy or whoever out on the street happy. If you're a vet or a vet tech, you know, you're in veterinary medicine, Um, It's not about making the owner happy. We have to be able to communicate this stuff appropriately so we can make the dog as comfortable as possible. We can respond appropriately to what they're trying to communicate to us, right? And just better that dog's interaction with people. Some dogs are scared of people. Some dogs are, uh, you know, they become defensive or aggressive around people because of their past experiences. Probably because no one was paying attention to their body language and responding appropriately to it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's just so many situations that we can respond to or act differently in based on our understanding of what the dog is actually communicating at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to jump right into it. The number one thing that we typically look at is the tail. Like you can see that from a distance. It's going to give you a very good indication of what that dog is feeling. So let's just say that we have a tail that's wagging. Mm -hmm. Okay. A wagging tail does not necessarily mean the dog's happy. It does not necessarily mean that the dog is friendly. If that tail is wagging, it could mean a variety of things, which we'll talk about. But in general, if you have a dog that's wagging its tail, it's aroused. And what arousal is, is the dog's excitement or stimulation level, Mm -hmm. right? So for example, you might see a dog wagging its tail when they're playing ball right? That dog is aroused. It's excited about playing ball, right? You might have a dog wagging its tail when it's approached by people. 
That dog is being aroused by the approach of the people. You might have a dog that's wagging its tail as it's biting a squirrel, right? That dog is aroused because it's in prey drive. You know what I'm saying? So just because a dog's tail is wagging does not, does not mean it's friendly, does not mean that it's happy. It means that it's aroused, okay? Does that kind of make sense? So we're going to go into yeah. some details of that. In general, if you have a dog's tail that is being held horizontal to the ground, right? Horizontal to the ground and wagging, that generally, in most cases, is going to mean friendliness, okay? Dog's tail horizontal to the ground, wagging, in general, it's going to mean friendliness, not in every case. And this brings up a good point. While we're talking about generalities of dog body language today, you do have to take into account the individual dog. Each dog is going to have slight differences in the way that they're maneuvering their body. So while, yes, we're talking about generalities today, you do need to pay more attention to your dog or dogs that you're regularly interacting with to understand their little specific differences. Okay. Um, but anyway, dog's tail horizontal wagging generally is going to mean friendliness uh, if you see that rear end moving at the same time, the whole rear end's moving oh, yeah. back and forth. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, that dog yeah. is just going crazy. <laughs> it's shaking its whole body. It can't contain itself. Its tail's wagging. That means friendliness. This is the kind of dog it's okay to approach, oh, yeah. right? Interact with them if the owner is okay with that. You know what I'm saying? So in general, that's what you're looking for to know if that dog's friendly. All right. Uh, does that make sense? Oh yeah. Good that's a happy go. boy. You seen happy that girl. before? That's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Aura. Aura loves to shake her tail and uh, wag her butt. Good to go. All right, so let's say that dog's tail is up. Mm. A tail that is held upward typically, generally, is going to signal dominance. So that dog is feeling empowered. It's feeling confident. It's feeling dominant, right? If it's wagging and it's up, it's aroused and it's dominant, which could be an indicator that the dog might react at something. It might bite at something. So you just need to be careful with this type of dog. If it's not your dog and you're walking up to a dog and it's doing this tail up, tail wagging, it might make the decision to react at you. It might make the decision to bite you. It might be okay with your approach. So you just need to take that into account when you're working with dogs, when you're around dogs, tail that is up, is dominant, wagging, it's aroused, has the potential to react, mm -hmm. right? Uh, has the potential to react at other dogs, has the potential to react at people, has the poten potential to react at children. So if you see this dog and they're maneuvering around, tails up wagging, you probably, if this is your dog, you want to redirect that dog off the situation, call him back to you. Don't let that child walk up to him. Don't let that other dog, you know, continue to interact with them. I mean, sometimes it's okay, right? But your dog might go overboard if it's feeling dominant at the time. So you just need to take that into account. Be aware of that. And tail up is normally above horizontal. Right? Above You're horizontal. You see a curve yep. in the tail. Well, especially if it's Depends held straight up and then it's curving at the top, that's an even higher indicator of dominance, mm. right? So in general, if a dog's doing this, I'm going to call them off of whatever scenario. So let's say we're at a park. We're with our friends. They have a dog. My dog and that dog are playing. All of a sudden, I see my dog's tail go up and maybe curl over. Strong indicator of dominance, so I might take a break from the play, call my dog off for a few minutes, let him go back to playing. Mm -hmm. Something may have happened to rile my dog up. My dog's feeling dominant. It may attempt to correct the other dog, right? Mm -hmm. All right, tail down. So let's talk about if that tail is down below horizontal. Maybe it's tucked. All right, if, your tail, if the dog's tail is down or maybe tucked, it's a very strong indicator that the dog is feeling a little bit insecure or a little bit nervous, and the more tucked that tail is, let's say the tail is tucked between the legs or wrapped up along the belly, that dog is super insecure at the time, super nervous, not sure what's going on, not sure what to do, right? So with this type of dog, you know, be very cautious. Number one, you don't want to trigger it into flight or flight mode. Fight or flight mode, you don't want to trigger that, okay? Because if you trigger flight, the dog is going to take off, you know, if it's not your dog or if it's your friend's dog, it could take off. It's going to seek somewhere that it's, it knows is safe. 
if you're out somewhere strange and nowhere is safe, this dog might just take off and now it's a wild goose chase mm-hmm. to try and get the dog, mm-hmm. right? Or you might trigger fight mode if the dog feels like it's cornered, it has nowhere else to go, it might lash out and bite you. And dogs that are in fight mode that are insecure or nervous with that tail tucked, a lot of times their bites are super powerful, right? They don't really know the pressure of their bite. They're trying to get away from the situation so they can cause serious damage. So if you see this, don't let your child continue going towards that dog. Don't let your dog keep going towards that dog. You need to take it easy with this dog. Allow it to kind of relax and get comfortable with you. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, let's say you're walking up to a dog. You see its tail kind of tuck between its legs, wrap up along its belly. It's standing there, right? I would follow the no talk, no touch, no eye contact rule. Act like that dog's not there. Yeah. This dog may attempt to walk up to you and sniff you a little bit. And some people, when that happens, they're like, oh, hey, you know what I'm saying? Boom. All of a sudden, they trigger what's known as a superstitious association, Mm -hmm. meaning that the dog freaks out. They have a negative experience. The dog doesn't want to be around that person. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So even if this insecure, nervous dog approaches you, act like it's not there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Try to get it as comfortable with you as possible. Let's say you go over to a family member's house, and they say, oh, hey, this is... uh, What's Rex. 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 Oh, well, we said Bruce last time. <laughs> we said week. Bruce last time. <laughs> We're with Rex. We got today. Rex today. So let's say we go over to the family's house. They got Rex. The tail is tucked. And they're like, oh, Rex is fine. He's fine. He's okay. He loves people. Right? Even yeah. though your family is saying that, look at the dog's tail. See what that dog is communicating. If that tail is tucked or wrapped up along its belly, even if the tail is slightly wagging, even if the tip is slightly wagging while it's tucked. The dog is super unsure about what's going on. The dog is super nervous. So take your time. Even though your family member is saying that it's okay, you can say something like, oh, it looks like your dog, it looks like Rex is a little bit nervous. I'm just going to, you know, act like I'm, I'm just going to act like he's not there so he can get comfortable with me being here, Mm -hmm. you know, or you can ask them, hey, do you have any treats that I could give him? And if they have treats or a piece of food that they are okay with you giving him, you can just hold that in your hand or drop it on the floor next to you. If he walks up and eats it, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. That means that he's not so nervous that he's not willing to take food from you, right? But he's still a little suspicious of you. But also that doesn't mean, hey, I can touch him now. Right, right. <laughs> just because they take a piece of food out of your hand doesn't mean you're good to go to pet him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you try to just all the, all of a sudden try and touch him when they're taking that food, you're probably going to trigger some type of mm-hmm. even further insecurity, superstitious association with this kind of dog, the focus is building up relationship, building up trust, which is going to take time. Yeah, you know and what I'm saying? I, so don't rush yeah. that. I feel like this happens, like you were saying, at a family member's house or a friend's house that you go over to. I feel like it's happened a lot with me now, recognizing these things that we're talking about with the tail and the other things we have to talk about. But like, um, if you go over to a family member's house, the dog, you can see that tail is lowered. It'll, the head might be lowered. You know, they're trying to sniff you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're watching the dog interact with other people in the house. The people are obviously, like, forcing, you know, if the dog is acting insecure, they're forcing themselves on the dog, hugging him, petting him. Obviously, he doesn't like it. Yeah. You know, he comes up to you. If this is me, like Chad said, I'm not really going to pet it or anything like that if the dog comes up to me i'm just going to be standing there i'll look at the dog you know i'll pay attention to what he's doing he might check out my leg or something or sniff my shoe mm-hmm. you might get a little bit more of that tail wag but like we said it doesn't mean yeah that he's good to go and if if the dog is you know hanging out seems to be still checking me out i might hold my hand out to him mm-hmm. you know i might hold the back of my hand out to him let him sniff the back of my hand yeah and normally if if uh, he just kind of sits there, mm-hmm. he sniffs your hand, he doesn't really react. Yeah. Or if he maybe turns his head away, yeah. you know, or, or that means he's still trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. You know, he's definitely not sure. You know, if he knows much or, uh, you know, nuzzles you with his nose, that might be a different story. But still, that's you still have to be careful. Yeah. Take it slow with the dog. Don't rush your uh, your desire to want to touch the dog or your desire to want to make your family member happy, you know. Don't rush it. Think about that dog, their mindset. This dog's feeling super nervous, super insecure. We want to make it as comfortable as possible. So the best thing to do, act like that dog is not there. 
no talk, no touch, no eye contact. Even if you offer it the back of your hand and he kind of sniffs it and muzzle nudges, don't just automatically start rubbing him down, right? Just take it easy. Let the dog just keep warming up to you. And uh, if this is a family member or a friend, maybe the first time you go over and see this dog, you're not even going to touch it. You're not yeah. even going to interact. Mm -hmm. Maybe the second time. You don't touch it. You interact. You're just getting the dog used to you being around and that it's no big deal if you're around. And then as the dog gets used to you doing that, the dog becomes more comfortable with you and your energy. And then the dog will be open to physical interaction yeah. if it's a dog that likes that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah. So something to talk about with the tail. You know, not all dogs have tails that are easy to read. Right? Some dogs have dock tails. Some dogs have like no tail. So when you're taking that into account... Just make sure that uh, if you see a dog with a dock tail, you can kind of imagine where their tail is at. You know, if they're holding it straight up, again, that's that dominance. If they're kind of lowering it as much as they can, you know, that's going to be that insecurity or nervousness. If it's horizontal, right, it kind of depends on the dog because some dogs, they if they hold the nub, what we call the nub of the dock tail horizontal, imagine there's a legit tail on there. It could come out and then up and then curl over. So just because a dog's holding a, their dock tail or their nub horizontal doesn't necessarily mean friendliness. But a lot of times dogs with uh, dock tails or no tail, they will compensate more with their rear end. So you can look at their rear end. If the whole rear end is shaking back and forth, that means they're probably friendly, right? If their rear end is tucking down, they're probably a little bit nervous, right? Those kind of things. So make sure you take that into account with dogs that are uh you know docked or don't have a tail um, but with that being said there's also other parts of the body that we're looking at we're taking into account with the tail so we're not just looking at the tail the tail is usually for me the first thing i'm looking at because it's super easy to identify in general where the dog's mind is at right um, but the next thing i'm kind of looking at and identifying is the ears so to me I consider ears to be in one of three positions. Either the ears are up, right? They could be up and facing forward, right? They could be up and kind of canted to the side, right? So dogs that are holding their ears up and facing forward, that is usually going to be in sync with their tail being up, which usually is an indicator of dominance, right? So if I see those ears up and forward, the dog is in general feeling dominant i'm taking the tail into account as well and so just keep in mind this dog could react at something it could bite something right so this kind of dog usually i'm going to redirect it i don't usually walk over to a dog that has its ears up tail up and just say, oh hey and start petting it down you know what i'm saying <clears throat> uh the ears could also be downward being held down or held relaxed that in general is going to sync up with the tail being down so we're feeling a little bit insecure, feeling a little bit nervous. Now, you could have a dog whose ears are uh, being held down and the tail is horizontal. That dog might be a little bit nervous, but it's also overall friendly. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of dog I'm approaching. I'll, sh I'll hold the back of my hand out, see if that dog's interested in interacting with my hand. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so just that's, that's just an example. You're taking the tail into account along with the ears, right? So if the ears are down, the tail's horizontal, the dog might be overall friendly. It might want to be friendly, but it might be a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to approach with caution. I'm going to be calm, confident, relaxed, ease into interacting with that dog versus just all of a sudden petting it all over. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, you're so pure, you know, pretty and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So try to avoid spikes in your energy. Keep it even keel, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, <clears throat> definitely not one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. You have to look at the whole dog as a, you know, the whole body of the dog, reading the whole body language. If you're just reading the ears, you might get a false reading. Mm -hmm. If that tail's lowered, if it's tucked, uh, probably not touching that dog. Yeah. You know, probably just going to maybe give it some treats or something, let it loosen up. If I got that horizontal wag, that butt wag, ears back, you know, definitely signs of friendliness. Yeah. You know, I'm probably going to pet that dog. Yep. You know, the ears forward, like you said. So we're looking at the tail. And the ears up to this point yeah. with everything that we've discussed. And the ears down could also be submission. So you hear me mm -hmm. talking about multiple things that one body signal could, could cue. It's just important to know all the variables, right? So if the ears are down, 
the tail and back end are wagging hardcore, the butt's wagging hardcore, right? The dog is signaling with the ears submission. It's friendly. It's most likely wanting that interaction, right? So in that case, it's okay to approach and, and touch the dog, right? So you got to take all factors into account, understand the body language, understand that individual dog, okay? Uh, I also have what I call a neutral position for the ears. So this is just basically like a relaxed state that the ears are in. And every dog is going to have a different neutral position. But if the, if the dog holds its ears neutrally, you can tell they're not yanking them back. You can tell it's not yanking them down. <clears throat> you can tell they're not pushing them up and forward. They're just relaxed. I'm like, okay, this dog's relaxed, right? The dog's chilling. And then I take that into account with the, uh, the tail position as well, right? So if the ears are neutral, they're relaxed, and the tail is down, you know, the dog is in general a little bit uncertain, a little bit nervous, Okay, so I just take that into account. I'm going to approach, you know, again, in a calm, confident, relaxed way, not make a big deal of what's going on. If I approach and the dog's ears are neutral or relaxed and the tail is up, right, the dog is, you know, somewhat relaxed but overall dominant. So, again, I'm going to approach with caution. I don't want to trigger the dog into further dominance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just some things to take into account, okay? Um, but those are the main things about the ears. They're going to hold them up hold them down or back and uh, somewhat neutral. Now you may see a dog, let's say you got a dog that reacts at other dogs. Mm -hmm. And as other dogs are passing by, you know, your house or where you guys are walking, your dog is holding its tail up, curled over. So what does that signal? Dominance, right? But the ears are shifting. They're fluctuating from up and forward to neutral, up and forward to neutral, right? And the dog is just staring at the dog as it passes by. So your dog's on the edge of reactivity at that point, especially if it's a dog that has a history of reacting. And in general, in this case, I'm going to redirect the dog, ask it to come to me, ask it to look at me, make sure it understands it doesn't need to stare at these dogs or no big deal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so people that have, might have a dog do that and they see that tail curl, yep. like, oh, my dog's dominant. Maybe not, maybe not the case, 100%. You know? I mean, the dog is feeling dominant. It doesn't yeah. mean it's going to run over there yeah. and dominate that dog. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's going to dominate you. Yeah. It's just what's going on in the dog's mind. Hyper-focusing. Hyper-focusing. Dog's feeling aroused. It's feeling dominant. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? In the moment. In the moment. For certain dogs. Right, for certain dogs. And every moment's different. So your dog may have been nervous the moment before that about the trash truck driving by. <laughs> then it sees another dog, and now it's feeling dominant. So then it throws dominant body signals. So, I mean, you just have to take all these mm -hmm. into account. Yeah. You know, and uh, work with your dog through these scenarios using engagement, using socialization to try and overall build calm, confident, relaxed uh, mentality in your dog. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? All right. So then we've talked about the tail, generalities of the tail. We've talked about generalities of the ears. Now let's talk about the head because that's also an indicator. And I usually will rate the head in one of two positions. It'll either be raised, right? So you know that dog who has its head raised, it's it's poised, right, to attack, right? Mm -hmm. That's generally seen with the tail up and the ears forward, right? So that's usually going to signal some type of dominance or alertness. And then if the head is lowered, right, you see that dog with the head kind of lowered a little bit. That's usually seen with the tail down, tail tucked, tail lowered, right? And that's usually going to signal insecurity, submission, uh, nervousness, something like that. Okay. So that's in general what you're seeing with the head. So let's say, you know, you're approaching a dog on the sidewalk, uh, as you're walking through the neighborhood, you see that the tail is down. You see that the ears are down or the ears are kind of neutral. And then you see the head kind of lowered, right? This dog is overall submissive, a little bit insecure, a little bit nervous. Right. So, again, you just want to put this dog at ease as much as possible. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you're walking towards a dog on the sidewalk in your neighborhood as you're walking and you see a dog walking towards you with its owner and you see that head is raised and poised, you see the ears are up or ears are neutral and the tail is up, maybe tail up and wagging. That dog is feeling overall dominant. Right. So that dog could if you're walking with your dog and you're like, oh, let's let our dogs meet. Right, That dog could come over to your dog and jump on it. It could immediately put its head over the shoulder of your dog to try and dominate your dog. It could react. It could uh, try snapping at your dog. 
bunch of variables, yeah. right? So in general, if I see this dog approaching me and my dog, I'm going to give it some room. I'm going to get around it. If the owner's like, oh, let's let our dogs meet, I'm like, no, we're okay. Yeah. Because I don't want my dog to be put in a position where it's getting dominated for no reason. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, go ahead and protect yourself in that situation. Go yeah. ahead and separate yourself. Walk across the street or maybe take a, if you're if you're walking in your neighborhood, maybe step into a neighbor's driveway. Mm-hmm. Give them some, uh, some time to walk past you. If they're trying to meet you, just say, hey, yeah, and just, you know. Not not a good idea right now, or we're training, or whatever you want to say, you know. Yeah. Because, I mean, half the time, I, even if I notice their dog is amped up, mm-hmm. acting dominant, whatever the reason may be, reactive, I normally assume that the owner does not know. You oh know? yeah. Owner is never not knows. reading the body language. Yeah. Thinks everything is goody goody with their dog, you know. Yep. Um, and normally I'm just going to assume that this dog might catch the owner off guard, yep. might rip the leash out of its hand or uh, the owner's hand, you know, mm-hmm. if, if it, you know, goes to make a move, you mm-hmm. know, so just always be ready yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Good to go. All right. The next, uh, body part group that we want to identify, and this is a little bit harder is the eyes, right? These are a little bit harder to see, but if you're like a, uh, let's say you're a vet tech and you're working with dogs, if you're a dog walker, right, for rover.com or something like that, and you walk into someone's house to get their dog, you can see their eyes pretty clearly. Or if you're at a friend's house or a family member's house, you can identify the eyes. So in general, you know, eyes that are very intense or staring at something very intensely, that could trigger, that could signal dominance, right? Could signal the dog's intent to go over there and do something. And in general, you're going to see intense staring with the eyes aligned with ears that are up and a tail that is up. It's all relating to dominance. And if my dog's doing that, I'm going to, this is what we call classic hyper-focusing where the dog is intensely staring at something. All body signals are showing dominance. The head is up. The head is raised. The ears are up. The tail is up. The dog is just staring at this thing. Could be another dog. Could be a person. Could be a child. Could be a deer or a squirrel or a rabbit, right? In general, I'm going to call my dog off, not allow them to continue hyper-focusing because the way I like to explain it is when your dog's in a position of hyper-focus, they've got two paths in their mind. They're going to go down one, one, one or the other. One path is the path where the dog breaks the hyperfocus on their own and decides no no uh, actions needed just keeps going about its business remains calm confident relaxed the other path is the dog for whatever reason is wanting to go over to this thing react at it dominate it whatever's going on right so i don't want to allow my dog to practice going down the path of reacting at things and uh, wanting to go over and dominate things, I want my dog to practice going down the path of calm, confident, relaxed. So if my dog needs help getting steered onto the right path, I'm going to help it, right? So after training, we have signals, we have cues, we have communication that we can signal to the dog to stop the hyperfocus, right? Before training, I'll probably move away from that distraction and regain the dog's engagement and focus on me instead of the distraction, right? The, the goal would be that if your dog's in a situation where it feels distracted, where it wants to be dominant, the dog should make the decision on their own to want to redirect off of that, pay attention to you versus continue hyper-focusing on this thing and then go down the wrong path and react. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So we're going to, we're going to teach that through our training process, but yeah. we kind of got off on a tangent there, but basically eyes staring, eyes that are intense, head aligns with head raised ears up tail up maybe tail wagging up dogs feeling dominant Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. if you're a vet tech and you're in an office with this kind of dog be careful and the way you handle the dog because uh, the dog may end up reacting at you the dog's feeling dominant it doesn't like being in the room with you you're approaching it like you know i've seen a bunch of vet uh, medicine people do oh it's okay it's okay (laughs) dog's like what the hell, Rawr, yeah, yeah. you know, decides to get you yeah. because it doesn't think it's okay. It doesn't want you walking over to it. Yeah. What I do in this case, if I was in vet medicine, uh, act like the dog's not there. 
walk over to the dog, right? Just continue to act like it's not there. Be calm, confident, relaxed. And then as, as some time passes, the dog should kind of get comfortable with you. Mm -hmm. You can give the dog some food rewards to try and communicate, hey, I'm not a bad thing. I'm a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, then the dog should start to relax with you. But I get it. You got a job to do. Yeah. The dog's in your office. You got to get its vaccinations or you got to check it out. Good yeah. to go. So take that into account as well. Um, but just understand the body language that you might be dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. If the dog's eyes are looking to the side. So let's say you're approaching a dog and the eyes are just like darting back and forth. They're looking to the side. That's usually going to align with the head slightly lowered the ears neutral, the ears down, the tail down or the tail tucked. This is a dog that's in conflict mentally. It's insecure. It's nervous, not sure about what's going on. So again, this dog, we want to, uh, you know, be calm, confident, relaxed, act like it's not there, allow it to get comfortable with the situation. You know, let's, let's say you're in a vet office again, you're in the vet exam room, this dog is in the room and you're like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, baby. You know, like that, the dog might freak out about that, you know what I'm saying? And then you could trigger fight or flight mode and if you are in a vet room, an exam room, and the dog attempts to flight, there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So then it might go to fight mm -hmm. and that's when a bite could happen, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so you just need to be aware of that, but in general, if the dog's looking to the side, don't force yourself upon it, right? Make that dog as comfortable as possible. So when you're saying dart the eyes to the side, is it almost like if it was me or you, mm -hmm. we see something out of the side of our perif peripheral vision. Is that what we're talking about? Or you see the dog looking specifically to one side or back and forth to both sides? Or yeah, The dog is just overall in conflict, so it could be looking to the side to try and avoid contact with you. Right. could be moving its head to the side. It's not like there's something in its peripheral that it's looking at. Mm -hmm. It's literally just trying to avoid contact with you, so it's trying to turn its head, its eyes away from you to avoid yeah. contact because it's insecure, uncertain, yeah. it's nervous about the situation. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why you take into account the head position, so the head's usually going to be crowded or lowered mm -hmm. the ears in general are going to be down the tail is going to be down or tucked you know what i'm saying so all these things are signaling to you who's understanding the language uh you know that the dog is feeling uncertain it's nervous your job should be to make that dog as comfortable as possible right don't force yourself upon the dog right good to go all right, then we have like what we what are known as whale eyes, where you know where the dog's kind of just like coming back a little bit. Its eyes are opening up like crazy. You know, it might be staring at you. This is in general uh, aligned with uh, the ears being pulled back very sharply, and the tail down, the tail tucked, maybe even the tail upward a little bit. It kind of depends, but in general, you see the dog kind of trying to get away from whatever. They're opening their eyes very wide. Maybe they're staring right at the thing or the person. Maybe they're looking a little bit to the side, but the ears are usually pulled very tightly back. And this is the kind of dog that's going into fight mode. It's about to bite, you know, or it's super, super unsure, super nervous, right? So if I'm trying to force myself upon this dog, there's a very high probability that a bite could be involved or a snap because the dog's uncomfortable. It doesn't want me approaching it. And wants to get away from me, mm -hmm. right? So if this happens, just kind of ease off, get away from the dog, let it be a little bit more comfortable with you before you're trying to do whatever you're doing. You know, if you're in vet yeah. medicine and you got to do something, maybe you get a second handler to kind of help handle the dog. If you're at a friend's house, just give the dog space. Don't force yourself upon the dog. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Kind of a common theme. Don't force yourself upon the dog. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If it's your own dog doing this to you, the dog's uncomfortable with what you're doing. So if you're used to like getting them on the couch and like hugging them and the dog's doing this routinely, maybe it's not biting you, right? But mm -hmm. it's doing this routinely. It's telling you that it's not comfortable with the situation. Mm -hmm. So even if your dog's not biting you, not reacting, but you see these signals, why force it into a bad situation, a bad scenario? Yeah. You know? So this is this more of a maybe more of a, a rarer case. Rarer case depends on the context. You could be a Rover. dot com uh, dog walker. Yeah, walking to someone's house, you're going to get the dog out of their kennel, and the dog's doing this. Yeah, right. Ooh, red flag. You know? Yeah, probably going to happen with a dog that you don't 
interact don't interact live with, with yeah. you know mm-hmm. so but i've seen a ton of pictures on social media which uh <laughs> you know they tick me off every time <laughs> where the people are like oh i just brought my baby home yeah let me let me show it to my dog here's your new baby brother new baby sister mm-hmm. you could look at the pictures and and see mm-hmm. the dog's ears are back the dog's got the whale eyes the dog's like not wanting anything to do with the kid but the kid's forced upon the dog by the parents mm-hmm. irresponsible parenting you should not be forcing your child upon a dog you know, you shouldn't be forcing your dog into that situation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but definitely so pay attention for it. Definitely pay attention. Yeah. Something to obviously to, always, uh, uh, to observe. You're, yeah. You should always be observing your dog and their body language. That's their number one communication style. Yeah. Right? All right. So then we go to the mouth. So uh, in general, you can pick up a couple signals off the mouth. Obviously, we know what a snarl is. You know, let's say a dog's showing their teeth. The dog's not wanting to be in that situation and wants to get out of that situation. Yeah. Usually snarling or showing of the teeth is obviously a warning signal, but mm-hmm. it means the dog does not want to be in that situation, does not like what you're doing. And so it is advised to you know, ease out of that situation and not press forward, right? Yeah. If you're in vet medicine and you're trying to handle a dog for whatever you need to do and the dog's doing this, you know, put a muzzle on the dog. Be safe. Mm-hmm. This dog could cause serious damage, right? <laughs> the dog may try to snap and warn you off if you continue pressing forward. The dog might just go in for a nice deep bite, mm. you know, cause some damage to you, mm-hmm. you know, so be careful. Sounds like me when I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> you're snarling when you're hungry? Yeah, I'll snap at you. Watch <laughs> out. <laughs> Holy cow. All right, then you got the classic grin where people are saying, oh, my dog's smiling. What, he's not smiling at me? Is that what you're telling me? (laughs) If your dog's smiling or grinning, in general, your dog is stressed out, might be anxious. So a lot of people, they have the misconception that a dog that is grinning or smiling is having a good time. Right? No big deal. You see it all the time on those, or oh, I do yeah. on the videos on Facebook, like the Dodo, oh, yeah. that page, Social where they is, have like, yeah. you know, the pit bulls that are like, you know, they do like They're a video. smiling because they got rescued. Yeah, <laughs> I adopted this dog. He's, look at him. He's smiling in the back seat. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, he's he's losing his mind in the back seat. He's making all these noises. Rawr, you know, yeah. he's having such a good time. Like, dude, your dog is freaking out. Yeah, dogs <laughs> usually, dogs <laughs> usually stress. Dogs usually anxious. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So... In that case, you want to alleviate the stress or anxiety as much as possible. Yeah. And if you're forcing yourself upon a dog and it's doing that, you should probably move away from that dog, give that dog some space, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, uh, to alleviate the stress from the dog as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now let's talk about a dog whose mouth is gaping. So a gaping mouth is usually aligned with a tuck tail, ears down or pulled back, Head lowered, maybe the head's raised depending on the context, right? Uh, Could be with uh, whale eyes or eyes looking to the side, but a gaping mouth is usually a dog under stress, an insecure dog, a nervous dog. They're just holding their mouth open. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Not panting. Not panting, just gaping. I don't think I've seen it as... It's pretty uncommon. Yeah, yeah. It's uncommon for most people that aren't working with dogs all day. Okay, yeah. But it's a dog that's stressed out, insecure um you know this dog could snap at you Mm -hmm. so just be careful i'm sure people that work in vet medicine have seen this i'm sure uh the rover dog walkers have seen this other dog trainers have seen this but the average pet owner probably hasn't seen this but it is an indicator of insecurity high levels of stress this this might go in um, you know a little bit with uh and then we might get to this later is uh like excessive yawning Mm, excessive yawning is a sign of anxiety Mm mm-hmm Right, the dog is just like anxious about what's going on, so it's just yawning all the time, yawning, mm-hmm. yawning, yawning. Doesn't you know, mean your so dog's tired. Doesn't mean it's tired. Yeah, yes, yeah, so and you can normally tell. Yeah, it's usually if you stressed pay attention. Out. Yeah, what uh, if you wake your dog up in the morning or your dog wakes up, and, you know, it does yeah. like a long. Oh yeah, yawn. like a stretch. That's different. Yeah, your dog's stretching out, yawning. That's different. Yeah, but now, if your dog's yeah. sitting there, right in your house or walking around your house and just constantly yawning. Yeah, I mean, you know, even with your if you're petting them. They Even if let, you're petting them when they're they yawning, might let it click one out. Yeah, usually yeah. that's aligned with the tail down or tucked, and then the ears are down. That's usually going to be stress, anxiety, yeah. maybe insecurity. The dog's just not comfortable. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you need to alleviate that. Try to make the dog as comfortable as possible. Just give him some space. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, but also the uh, 
going back to the dog's mouth, you know, so we talked about a gaping mouth. The dog uh, could be pulling its lips back a little bit, right? Not grinning, but like just pulling the lips straight back. That's another signal of stress. Mm -hmm. So just got to be aware of that, careful of that, and alleviate the uh, the situation as much as possible. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people that might be seeing some of these combinations of body language or body language could be people that work in like a doggy daycare mm -hmm. or a dog boarding facility. You know, they have dogs come in. They're there for a couple of days. You know, the dogs could be stressed out. The dogs could be... Uh, showing different signals if it's a super dominant dog mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying it might be throwing some signals might be uh, a risk to the people that are handling the dog so they need to be very aware of these body language cues understand probably what the dog's feeling and be able to uh, to go off of that you know what i'm saying so uh with the, with that being said let's talk about just a couple scenarios you know where you might see some of these signals you know, we already talked about the vet office a couple times. Um, but, you know, let's say you're in a vet office. Maybe you're in the waiting room with your dog. And your dog is kind of just standing there while you're sitting down. It's looking around. Its, ear, it's uh, ears are in a neutral position. The tail is kind of neutral, right, which means it's kind of relaxed, which means it could be fluctuating from slightly up, slightly down, slightly up, slightly down. So the dog is kind of just taking everything in. Right, then you have another dog come in, into the waiting room. And uh, your dog's tail goes up, ears come up, uh, dog staring at the other dog. So what's your dog telling you? Oh, it's uh, getting ready to get a little dominant. A little, little dominance a little action. Thinking about maybe making a move. Right, possible <laughs> reaction. So what I would do in that situation, call your dog over to you. You know, you probably got on a leash, but it's kind of just hanging out. Call your dog over to you, have it sit, have it lay down, mm -hmm. something like that. You know what I'm saying? Don't allow it to continue hyper-focusing. You know and what I'm it saying? And might, it might stay in that mindset if you don't have a way to, you know, correct your dog out of it. Right. Or hold it accountable. You can maybe just move to the – move move a couple chairs down yep. a little bit farther. But, I mean, just be ready to deal, deal with it. You know? Yeah, engagement is going to go a long way. So, I do recommend you guys do your engagement work with your dog. That way you can call them out of these situations build up a look command that way they can look at you whenever you need them to yeah and put it put in some accountability into your training progression you can go back to our podcast on training progressions to understand how we're going to go from starting point to end point with training um, but that's one scenario let's say you're walking down the sidewalk your dog is loose leash walking not strict heel position not pulling on the leash just loose leash walking and uh you got some kids coming down the sidewalk and your dog's tail goes downward, mm -hmm. right? And your dog's ears come back and your dog starts looking to the side a little bit. Mm. What is your dog signaling to you? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, nervous, uncertain. So what do you do? You give the kids some room. You get off that sidewalk, maybe cross the street, maybe go into the street a little bit. Maybe the kids are like, doggy, doggy, yep. doggy. They want to come over to your dog and like, hey, no petting today. Yep. You know, we're just going for a walk. We're doing some training. Thank you. And they might keep following you for they a little bit. They might keep following you. You just <laughs> ignore them. You keep doing your thing. Your dog might be on edge, but, I mean, you keep moving. Yeah, your you priority know? is making your dog as comfortable as possible. If, mm -hmm. you, if you were, like, trying to be a nice guy, which I understand, you know, trying to be like that, that good person in the neighborhood, oh, everyone can pet my dog, but your dog's uncomfortable with it, you're not helping your dog. Yeah. And if you continue forcing your dog into situations that they are not comfortable with, you could find yourself in a situation where your dog feels like it needs to bite something to get out of a situation. Therefore, you have pushed it into fight or flight mode. And it may not happen the first time, right? It may not happen the first time that you let someone interact with your dog. It may take a while. But if your dog is just constantly put into situations where it's not comfortable, right, eventually it's going to get fed up with it and try to find a way out. It's better to not be the nice guy in the neighborhood than to have to deal with a uh, medical bill that's, of your dog true. biting a kid. But <laughs> my, my perspective, too, is like I'm, I'm in it for my dog. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to have my dog's best interest in mind. I'm trying to enhance my relationship with my dog. So what I try to do is try to explain the why to people. Mm -hmm. Why can't I pet your dog? Well, it's because I'm training. My dog's not 100% comfortable yeah. with people right now. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, if my dog is comfortable taking a food reward from random people, I might say, hey, could you help me out with some training? Yeah. Here's one of my food rewards. I take it out of my pocket. I give it to the person. I say, you know, just hold out your hand. No big deal. Don't make a big scene. 
you know, and just offer it to my dog. If my dog eats it, cool, thank you. Yep. Right. So that is one way I've used before to help alleviate people from feeling weird or feeling offended yeah. when I say, hey, you can't pet my dog. Yeah. But with that being said, you know, I'm more concerned about my dog's well-being uh, instead of trying to make everybody happy by petting my dog. Yeah. You know, what I'm and saying? even if you give them the food, they might give the dog the treat and then think everything's fine and try and pet your dog so yeah. always be ready for that yeah, you gotta as well. be careful of that too you gotta be careful of that yeah i've had people get seriously upset with me why can't i pet your dog yeah i've always been good with you know german shepherds they, they're just good with me you right. know what i'm saying sure, buddy sure i'm like okay i understand but uh you know not today my dog i'm yeah. training you're not petting it you know what i'm saying yeah. sometimes you got to be kind of up front and rude yeah. with you know Turns out, uh, you know, you just don't have uh, the privilege of petting every dog. Right. You know, it's not your privilege. Right. Some people think they got that, you know. So anyway, yeah. going into another scenario, let's say uh, that you are you are a rover.com mm. dog walker, mm -hmm. right? I'm not sure how the whole process works, but let's say you go to someone's house and you're going to walk this dog or maybe I think they do introduction sessions. So maybe you go over to do an introduction session and... Uh, they have their dog in a kennel, so you go over to the kennel, you got your leash, you're about to ch about to try to get the dog out, and you open the kennel, and the dog is like slinked back in the corner, the ears are back, the tail is super tucked, you know, the dog's looking to the side, or it's giving you whale eyes. Yeah. That dog is definitely not comfortable. Yeah. I would not reach into that kennel to try and hook a leash up. Nope. And if you let that dog out of the kennel, now it's running around the house, you're probably not going to get it back into the kennel, because the dog is not going to be cool with you approaching it. Mm -hmm. right in general so in that case you might uh you know not do the walk that day contact the owner say hey i was i was uh over to get your dog your dog was a little bit uncomfortable i'd like to come by when you're there and do a little introduction session with your dog with you mm -hmm. i'm i'm thinking you know if i'm the owner that hired you and you tell me that i'm impressed yeah number one you're in a, you're a professional dog walker you're reading the dog's body language. You're making it comfortable. That might be something that I'm worried about. I'm worried about my dog being uncomfortable with you. And you tell me, hey, I'm seeing the body language. I'm a little bit uncomfortable. The dog's a little bit uncomfortable. I'd like to do an intro session. The owner's like, oh, cool, sweet. And then what you would do for the intro session is you would take a short walk with the owner where they hand you the leash throughout the walk. Maybe you give some food rewards, but you're just kind of bonding with that dog. And you can do a couple repetitions of getting the dog out and in back into the kennel with the owner there so the dog is more comfortable doing it okay but if you're a rover dog walker and you're trying to do this and the owner is just uh you know not cool or you can tell the dog's even nervous with the owner maybe you decide to say hey you know i just don't think i'm a good fit for you that's going to protect you you know from uh any damage that could be caused possibly by the dog if you're forcing yourself and the dog into these situations, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So use your common sense when it comes to these situations, always look out for the dog, have the dog's best interest in mind, you know, look out for yourself too. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Let's talk about another situation. We can, this can be the last scenario. Uh, let's say you go over to a friend's house. You haven't seen them in a while. Maybe it's one of your college buddies, one of your high school buddies. You haven't seen them for a while. They're having a little get together, hey. a little ten year reunion. Hey, I'm having a hey, I'm having a party over at having my a house. cookout for a little college football. I'm having a cookout. <laughs> you guys, come on over. It's been a while since I've seen you guys. Yeah. You go over to their house. They got a dog. Let's say it's a lab. You know, labs generally good family dog, right? Yeah. That's what everybody says. You're looking at this dog. This dog is amped. Oh yeah. Tail is up, held high. Dog's head is up, ears are forward, you're walking in, this dog's walking right up to you. <laughs> Tail not wagging, you know, it's just up and stiff, the body, the dog's body overall stiff. Mm. What would you think? Oh, shoot. Um, yeah, I'm going to be <laughs> ready to do something. I mean, uh, I'm definitely just going to be neutral. The dog's wanting to come over and dominate your ass. I mean, you know what, what if I'm he saying? starts humping you? <laughs> what if the dog starts humping you? <laughs> that is possible. The owner's like, oh. <laughs> the owner oh, thinks yeah, it's he does hilarious. That to everyone, yeah. <laughs> Dog grabs on your leg, humping you. Dog's straight up dominating you, dude. <laughs> What I do if the dog is hunting me is I try to grab the collar and, like, try to get it off my leg, you know? Careful but grabbing it, though. 
you got to be careful. The dog could react to you. Yeah. I mean, depends on the level of dominance in the dog. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. But these dogs that latch on to people, they start humping them, dude. Holy yep. cow. Maybe you just uh, if the dog is coming up to you, you know, there's a quick five-second checkout. Maybe just keep moving. Yeah. You know, keep walking through the house. You might get yeah. distracted by something else. Yeah. I mean, if you're of no interest to the dog, the dog will, like, leave you alone. Yeah. So if you're neutral and the dog, like, finds no interest in you, most likely the dog will leave you alone. But if the dog, like, if you're just neutral to the dog and the dog's, like, super assertive, mm-hmm. they might start pushing themselves onto you. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So in that case, you need to manipulate the environment somehow. You know, you could use some food rewards if, if possible to try and lure the dog into different obedience to make it work for you. You know, but if the dog's just super assertive, latching on to you, trying to hump you, stuff like that, have a conversation with the owner, yeah. you know. Hey, you they understand. For, yeah. yeah, you got a leash for this guy, you know. Mm-hmm. He keeps humping me. Oh, yeah, that's what he does to yeah, people. Yeah. Let him finish and then uh, then he'll well, be well, done, <laughs> you know. Let him finish humping yeah, you, yeah. then he'll be done. I'll be like, yeah, I'll take him out on the backside, go outside, and <laughs> run back inside, close the door, you know. Somehow know. get out of the situation. Yeah. You know Hopefully the owner is uh, understands Yeah. and uh, – has a brain. <laughs> if it's the, uh, what's like the number one guy on the football team, what do they call that guy? The quarterback? Like the jock. Oh, I guess the it's jock. it's like the yeah. jock of the high school. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You go over to his house and he just wants to dominate you too. You know? <laughs> well, <laughs> He's going to let his dog dominate you. It you might know? be time to, to take off. <laughs> yeah, time to roll out. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, that just made me think of another scenario, the opposite. You, you know, same, same situation, friend from college or high school, they're having a cookout. They call you over, 10-year reunion. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, my dog's super friendly. My dog loves everybody. You go over there, the dog is like, you can tell it's nervous. The head is lowered. It's kind of crouching down. It's kind of moving around slowly. Ears are back. Tail is lowered, maybe slightly tucked. And they're like, oh, yeah, this is is Frank. He's super friendly, super friendly. It might be a lab. You know, you're like, oh, shoot, Frank's super nervous. You know, he's super uncomfortable. He's stressed. Yeah. You know. All you can do for Frank is just be cool, be calm, confident, relaxed. Don't force yourself upon him. And if other people are forcing themselves upon him, he may not be reacting at them or anything like that. But super uncomfortable, right? Not good for Frank. He may start to gravitate toward you a little bit because you're more calm, you're more relaxed. So just continue acting like he's not there. Still remain neutral. Yeah, still be neutral. Act like he's not there. Do your thing. Let him just uh, do his thing be as comfortable as possible yeah you know there have been times where i go to places and i'm a everyone knows i'm a dog trainer mm-hmm. you know so i go to places and i say something like hey frank's uncomfortable mm-hmm. you know and they're like oh really yeah and then i kind of explain the body language to them they're like oh that makes sense you mm-hmm. know or i see kids i might be at someone's house for a cookout and uh, some of the other people that came they have kids the kids are bombarding the dog because that's what they're used to doing you know what i'm saying uh, in that case, I'll, I'll generally try to steer the kids away from the dog, try to redirect the kids off the dog. Cause I can see the dog's uncomfortable. And if the dog's uncomfortable and the kids keep, uh, you know, trying to interact with it and the dog gets to a point where it doesn't want that anymore, for sure. It could definitely react at the kids, which I don't want, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like because I have this knowledge, it's my job to say something, you know, even when, uh, it's not cool. Even when it's not the norm to say something, even when the people think that their dog is 100% friendly, 100% comfortable, you know what I'm saying? Someone's got to stand up for the dog, say something, you know? So if you guys are listening to this, you hear this body language discussion, you see some of these things, you can pinpoint them. You need to step up on behalf of the dog wherever you're at. Have that dog's best interest in mind, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So uh, you got any scenarios or anything you want to discuss before we wrap this up? No, nah, we cover most scenarios that I would normally deal with. Probably the one that we just talked about with the insecure dog at the house you go over to is probably the most common one I see yeah, or where common. it's our larger get together. There's, you know, more than 10 people or 10 or more people in the house. Yeah. You can see the dog slinking around mm-hmm. or maybe following the owner very closely, mm-hmm. head lowered, you know, tail lowered. People yeah. come up to it. The tail's wagging very low, yeah. you know, or maybe starting to tuck a little bit. The dog is lowering its head. The people are still petting it, you know. Yeah. Dogs might not react, but, you know, you just kind of 
over the course of like what we talked about, once you start to realize these things, you really start to see the situation like anywhere you go. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of just turns into you get an immediate read on the dog. Yeah. You know, I'm not petting this dog right now or I'm just going to be neutral with this dog, you know, or this dog's happy, you know, or this dog, you know, nudges my hand with his nose. I'll give him some food rewards here we can get later on. Yeah. You know, so like Chad said, you stand on behalf of the dog and, you know, if the dog is being pushed into a scenario it doesn't want to be in, but also I kind of take the stance of I'm not going to tell every owner of every dog that I come in contact with, like, yeah. hey, the, hey, your dog is you're freaking yeah. out. You got to do something right now. Yeah, you know, yeah, kind of read, yeah. the, read the room a little bit. Yeah, you don't need to say it every time, but, yeah. like, if there's a bad situation, like, you've been to that party where the kids are just yeah. bombarding the dog, you well, got to step are, in. Yeah, kids are definitely different. Yeah. Kids I mean, I've, I've even been at parties or get-togethers where uh, adults are bombarding the yeah. dog. The dog's super uncomfortable. I'm like, hey, guys, you know, he's uncomfortable, yeah. and here's why, and mm-hmm. I explain it, you yeah. know. Yeah. But average Joe on the street, not going to say anything. Mm-hmm. Average Joe at the restaurant, usually not going to say anything, yeah, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, just like like we've been saying, excuse me, um, this whole time, it's more than just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. You have to pay attention to the tail. You have to pay attention to the head. You have to pay attention to the uh, to the ears. Mm-hmm. You know, look at the eyes. What's happening? Yeah. Look at the look at the scenario that you're in. You're in a house with crowded people. The dog's got his head lowered. Yeah. You're in, you're you know walking down the street. The dog is hyper focusing on you or your dog. Be prepared for something to maybe happen. You know, likelihood that it's going to happen. Maybe not so much, but there's always that scenario. Mm-hmm. Maybe you got an off leash dog comes wandering in the neighborhood you're walking your dog this has happened to me a couple different times we've talked about uh different scenarios before yeah this dog's coming up to you and he's showing major signs of dominance yeah you know and he's maybe staring at you and your dog you're kind of reading the room the dog might be creeping toward you a little bit you know and mm-hmm. he's hyper focusing on you. you better figure out what to do in that situation pretty mm-hmm. quickly you yeah. know so always be ready always be uh reading every dog you come in contact with the 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 body language yeah i feel like most dogs are gonna be okay you're gonna get that horizontal tail wag but still pay attention to every dog you at least come into contact with so yeah. you can get a general read of the room yeah you know so. for sure kind of a rule of thumb for me and i know what we do here um every dog that we first come into contact with even if it's showing friendliness even if it's showing insecurity dominance whatever we're gonna basically be neutral to that dog no talk no touch no eye contact me we're walking the dog on a leash because the other thing too is some dogs are just used to everybody walking up to them and giving them attention Mm -hmm. like especially super friendly dogs so that can kind of just get them their self-control the self-control is non-existent Mm -hmm. because the dogs are just used to every time someone's around they get touched So one of the things we can do is help that dog implement self-control, which helps that dog be more neutral because something that also happens is dogs that are used to just always getting interaction, always getting touched. They can't focus, right? They, they, they feel like they have to go see everybody. And let's say the owner's walking the dog down the street, the dog's going to every single person, right? Up and down the street, trying to get attention. The dog needs to have some self-control. And understand that it's not going to get interacted by everybody that it ever sees. Mm -hmm. And it also kind of triggers in the dog's mind um, that the dog needs to be paying attention to you or the owner more, uh, especially in different situations. So a dog that's not used to paying attention to the owner, right, it can start making bad decisions on its own. We want that dog to check in with you, Mm -hmm. make good decisions, have good self-control. And one way we're going to do that is by when we first meet the dog, be neutral to it. And then establish a relationship and also establish value in ourself from the dog's perspective. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you want a visual on how some of this stuff looks, uh, like we've talked about before, our YouTube channel has a bunch of different content on it. We got dog body language videos specifically so people can see visual examples Mm -hmm. of how to read this dog or how to read a dog. You know, we have insecure dogs. I think we might have a a dominant dog or a dog that is... uh, very insecure but exhibiting you know that fight body language yeah when in reality it doesn't want to do anything but you know yeah 
if you want to see visuals, you know, you can look at that or you can just start, I mean, just start looking up videos of random docs yeah. and just start reading the body language. Yeah. Honestly. Exactly. Take this information into account. Remember, it's going to vary just a little bit based on the individual dog. These are gen- these are generic uh, body language cues and mm-hmm. signals that we talked about today. Pay more attention to your dog. Start to see their yeah. individual pieces of the body language in different situations, different contexts. Your dog could easily fluctuate from neutral to nervous to dominant very rapidly in different situations. You know, So pay attention to that. Figure out what situations it's feeling what in. Build up your engagement. Build up your socialization. Go from there. So um, we do appreciate you guys listening. We do appreciate your support. Uh, we appreciate all feedback. Please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcasting platform. Mm-hmm. Please uh, subscribe to us on YouTube and uh, share our uh, information so we can help other people. Let us know what you want to hear about on a podcast. If you want to uh, hear more from me and Ben, mm. a.k.a. I call him Bunny. If you want to hear from mm. more from me and Bunny, mm. Instagram. Mm-hmm. Ben is uh, at Big Boy Jabba. Big Boy dot Jabba. Big Boy dot Jabba. I'm Chad dot Singer thirteen on Instagram. We're both on Facebook. Chad Singer, Ben Singer. Yeah. Uh, also, Canine Revolution Dog Training. Right. Yeah. Oh. Check out Canine Revolution's uh, Instagram. You're gonna get probably way more dog content on there. But yep. me and Chad share different stuff on our personal accounts. But yep. Some of it's dog related, some of it's chicken related, some <laughs> of it's cat related, yeah. <laughs> some of it's guinea fowl related. As you probably, if you're watching this on YouTube, you've probably seen the chickens wandering around, the guineas wandering around, and the oh, cat. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, check that stuff out. Again, we appreciate you guys. Let us know if you have any feedback. And uh, until next time, out.